everybody here to uh, an evening given by one of my favorite people. So I'm very happy to be introducing Rabbi Mary Zaymor, the executive director of the Women's Rabbinic Network, which is a partner organization of the reform movement. Um, the Women's Rabbinic Network works to narrow the wage gap, create safer, respectful communities, and promote equity. Rabbi Zaymor is the co-leader of the Reform Pay Equity Initiative and heads the Women's Rabbinic Network's clergy. My relationship with Rabbi Zaymor goes back to when she was a rabbinic student. She was an intern at Temple Emmanuel, and I had the honor of attending her ordination, which I still remember so well. And I have watched her very distinguished rabbinic journey as she served Temple Emmanuel as an assistant and then an associate rabbi, and then served Temple Benayor in Morristown as their associate rabbi. And I know how deeply committed Rabbi Zamor is to Judaism and to living an ethical life. We were all so proud of Rabbi Zamor when her book, The Sacred Table, Creating a Jewish Food Ethic was published and then designated a finalist by the National Jewish Book Awards. Rabbi Zamor will talk to us this evening on the subject of coveting and contentment. She will be referring to her latest book, the Sacred Exchange, Creating a Jewish Money Ethic. So please welcome my good friend, Rabbi Mary Zamor. Hmm. Thank you, Phyllis. And it's so good to see so many familiar faces, so many beloved faces, and to be with you. So before we dive into some really um, interesting texts, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the evolution of the Sacred Exchange. A lot of people ask me, you know, how did you come to, to do um, an anthology about money after doing an anthology about food? Uh, they seem like very different topics. Uh, of course, they have in common um, what it means to lead an ethical Jewish life and how Jewish uh, tradition and text can guide us as liberal Jews in our everyday living. But the, uh, the evolution of that um, was after the Sacred Table came out and, and did meet with a, you know, a great deal of success. Um, my publisher kept asking me, okay, so what's the next book? And, um, and I, I have a very uh, ardent rule that I never tell people, if you ask me like what I'm working on next, I'll never tell anybody until I actually sign a contract with my publisher because I just, know that it may shift or change and then you know you may see me two months later and then ask me how the book about string beans have been going and i'll be like string beans i'm done with string beans i'm up to carrots mm -hmm. so just not to cause confusion i always just um you know wait till i know i'm set on a topic so uh, my publisher was was pushing me to pick another topic and i was doing research and thinking about what I wanted to focus on, knowing that whenever you write, you really live with that material for a very long time. And when you do a book, it's a very long time. And you have to be just excited to your core. You have to be in love with the material to really sustain yourself about it because you know you hit ups and downs and challenges and um, you really just need that energy behind it to get it done. So, um, I was really having trouble finding that topic. I, I kept honing in on a good topic and I knew it would make a fabulous book and I would start to outline the book and then it just didn't make my heart sing. So I knew it wasn't the topic. And I happened to participate, I was invited to participate in, a, in an amazing project called the Op-Ed Project. It's a nonprofit secular organization that invites cohorts of uh, female leaders thought leaders to come together um, to give them the skills and the encouragement to be more vocal in their thought leadership in the public space. And so I was invited to participate in a cohort of Jewish leaders. And, um, and part of that exercise was really feeling comfortable with the title of expert, which is something that women struggle with, both as our greater society does not treat them as an expert, even when they are. And, um, and we have trouble taking ownership of that by ourselves. 
And so in that, the, these exercises that they led us in, in over three days of looking at both our comfort level with our expertise and ways that we could come to expand our voices publicly, they asked us to hone in on our expertise and then to pull it apart into different facets. And as I did this exercise, looking at my food expertise and in, in the intersection of Judaism, liberal Judaism and food, I came to realize that I've been really, um, been exploring that topic in several different facets. In uh, what it means to have ritual practice as a liberal reform Jew, what it means to uh, look at how uh, our food uh, chain and, and cultures um, affect the environment, and, uh, and finally, the economic impact of, of food. And I had, as I had been doing my, my lecture tour with the uh, Sacred Table, serving as scholar in residence in many communities, um, and really had visited uh, over 60 different communities with that book, um, I found that I had drifted in, in what I was emphasizing. And I was emphasizing more topics of internalized and externalized cost. I was talking more about SNAP uh, food stamp benefits, um, how we can make food, uh, food, nutritious food, equitable and available to all. And it was in that moment that I realized that I had an interest and an expertise in in food and rather from food to money. And that I had actually been teaching and exploring this in many different ways and many different iterations throughout my career as a rabbi. And that's where the sacred exchange uh, came alive. And I found uh, that, that topic that made my heart go pitter patter and I fell in love uh, with the topic. And so that's where the Sacred Exchange came from. We explore many, many topics in this anthology. That's one of the things I love about anthologies is bringing experts uh, together um, to explore many different topics in a horizontal manner um, that gives a lot of breadth to the, the topic that sometimes surprises people with topics that they wouldn't expect to be part of that conversation and, um, and to explore many different layers of a topic. So tonight, what we're going to be looking at is um, a very different reading of, uh, of a traditional topic. And what I like to do for communities, and especially my home community, is rather than just giving you material that is a chapter in my book, um, I'm really giving you unique material that is, uh, you know, certainly inspired by the many topics we explore in the sacred exchange from uh, the, the theological meaning of money to uh, difficult conversations to the ethics of money and how we deal with money. But this is a, a unique way of looking at a particular topic. So I'm going to just share my screen now. And um, the topic we are looking at tonight is hoarding toilet paper, coveting and contentment. So as I share my screen, I'm just gonna put this on the right uh, slideshow from the beginning, beret sheet, nope, next one. Okay, so here we are. Um, and um, everyone sees what I see, hoarding toilet paper, coveting and contentment, just nod your head if that's what you see. Awesome, great. So um, I have been exploring this topic of co coveting and contentment for uh, in my entire rabbinate. Uh, the, the 10th commandment of do not covet is uh, something that has always had a lot of fascination for me. And, uh, and so I, I, I find myself returning to it continually it is what I've always taught is the forgotten commandment. Uh, when people are asked to write the Ten Commandments or to say them, they usually forget coveting. Um, it is a very cryptic commandment, and, um, but I think it's a very rich topic for all of us to think about. And as I've been uh, going around and, and lecturing about the sacred exchange, I've been doing teaching some of this material. And, uh, and it really has struck me since this pandemic has hit um, how, how my view of something that I thought I knew inside out has shifted in, in many interesting ways. 
So many months ago, I know it feels like about a thousand years ago before we all self-isolated and uh, even, you know, had the word pandemic on our lips. Um, when I was teaching coveting and contentment, I was framing it uh, as a conversation about wants versus needs. And it still is that. It's still a conversation about wants versus needs. But in normative life, that topic in many ways is much easier to grasp. Because when you talk about things that you need and things that you want, well, yes, I, I need a car. But maybe I want a really cool car. Maybe I want a special car, a snazzy car, a luxurious car. Um, and maybe what we need to deal with as individuals, for the most part, has to, and when we think about coveting, is trying to curb um, our wants from getting out of control and to focus more on the core need. Um, and that does not mean that we aren't allowed beautiful things. Judaism supports 100%, uh, for instance, the idea of hidor mitzvah, the beautification of a mitzvah, teaches us an appreciation for beautiful things. In the Torah itself, we know when, when the Israelites built the Mishkan, the portable tabernacle, Bitzalel, uh, Ohliav, were in charge of that project and they made it beautiful. And that is part of our tradition as well. We're not a tradition of ascetics. We're not a tradition that, that um, says we can't have beautiful things or spend money or have money. All those things are perfectly fine when they're balanced in our lives. So now we're going to, oh, wrong way. So, uh, but now during this pandemic, um, I think it's really brought us all into focus with exactly what do we need and what do we want? Because we've been forced to really confront as we try to get groceries, um, what do we actually need? So this is from a website literally called howmuchtoiletpaper.com where you can go on and they have all sorts of calculators and you can decide based on how many people in your home and how many times you may visit a bathroom per day, how much toilet paper do you actually need? This is not my family's uh, toilet paper needs. I just want to make that clear. This is what comes up on the screen when you go to it. Um, and it kind of makes you laugh because it's, it's kind of ridiculous. But I'm sure if you're like me, this is not so funny as you're trying to actually take care of your needs. So here's another little view of what's been going on in the world. I just grabbed off uh, Facebook and, you know, some of the memes we've been seeing about toilet paper and hoarding toilet paper. Um, the image on the right in the glass of water, does everybody get that? <laughs> I just want to make sure because when I showed it to my family members, they did not get that. So if you know how to grow an avocado and you, you take the pit and you put toothpicks and put it floated in water, that's how you can make an avocado um, plant. So it's a little joke. So I just wanted to um, you know, share those. So there's something like a little funny about this, but at the same time, not so funny. So I just want to invite all of you now. Um, I can't see the chat, so this is when I need my helpers. I need either Aileen or, or Phyllis to unmute yourself and to help me. Would you put in, so I'm inviting everybody who's participating to just put in the chat right now something that you know that is hard to secure right now. Something that you are finding difficult because perhaps there's a supply chain problem or because people are hoarding it. Now, I cannot see the chat because I'm sharing my screen. So again, uh, Phyllis, is, you're gonna have to take yourself off uh, uh, okay. and, re and read some of those chats okay. to me. Can you hear me now? Can you, you hear me? can, absolutely. Okay, Lysol wipes, mm -hmm. asparagus, paper towels. There's another Lysol. I wrote detergent. Um, hand sanitizers, masks, what else? That's it. Uh, parrot seed. Oh, I didn't know that. Gloves, yes. Plastic gloves. Mass N95, mass N95, mass. Mm -hmm. gloves. I think that's it for any more. I think that's it. Okay. So, mm -hmm. um, so 
with, within that list, we, we hear things that are very essential right now. Uh, we all need masks to be able to go out to a grocery store. We may need gloves also. Um, we may need Lysol wipes or an equivalent product to be able to wipe things down before they come into our homes and to clean properly. Um, the parrot um, may need their seed. That is, that is a vital thing for that animal. And I'm assuming that's Lucille Rosenberg saying that, but who knows. Um, uh, you know, asparagus, um, you know, you could probably find a substitution for it, but there's something very unsettling for all of us who are so used to going to a grocery store and just getting what we need. It is, it is very unsettling. There's two more things that popped up, certain medications yes. and vitamin C. Mm. So good. I'm glad that you mentioned whoever put those because actually I was getting to the medications. As um, different um, pundits and not so pundits have um, publicly said that certain things are good to take right now because maybe they cure or shorten uh, the coronavirus, some very important medications that other people use on a regular basis for some very serious illnesses have come in very short supply. So their vital needs have been impeded uh, because of, you know, tr basically rumors about what may or may not help uh, the coronavirus. And yes, yeah, certain uh, vi vitamins, like especially things that are known to support your immune system, are also in very short supply right now. So, um, you know, while we can kind of laugh about the toilet paper thing, because as we all know, you can actually live without toilet paper. There are, uh, you know, it's a matter of comfort and not uh, other things. But right now we all do need masks. People do need their medications. So the idea that some people are hoarding these is, um, is a very serious matter. So we're going to now uh, look at um, the idea of coveting. Um, and eventually this will all loop back, I promise you, to the idea of hoarding. And uh, we're not looking at a halachic legalistic view of hoarding. We're really looking at what our Jewish text, the ways we can be informed uh, from um, in terms of uh, what our text can teach us about the human impulse and our relationship to things. And, and uh, so we're just going to take a look here at the 10th commandment. So during this session, if you have a question, um, please just go ahead and put it into the chat box. As I told you, I cannot see the chat box as I'm sharing my screen for the slideshow. Um, and Phyllis, I have you off, I have you muted right now, but if you need to uh, interrupt me with a question, just wait till I pause and then you can share it with me. So here we have uh, the Exodus version of the 10th commandment. And I've highlighted the word lo tachmod, do not cut it. And then it goes on to talk about things. Now, um, I'm saying things, and then I'm going to qualify that because, of course, it says the house. It talks about then the wife and the servants, the slaves, really. Indentured servants is probably a better translation. And then back to oxes and donkey and anything that is your neighbors. Even though it is disturbing to see people and even animals in this boat, uh, the way this is dealt with legally, they're all things. So it is the idea of low talk moding, I'm going to say it that way, not coveting, whatever that means, um, something that your neighbor, someone else has in their legal possession. So um, the idea of um, whatever that takmod is, even when we say it in the English, like, okay, well, exactly what is coveting? You know, people commonly say, well, that means you want it, you envy it, you desire it. Um, but Judaism, of course, um, understands that we have different impulses and 
there are good things about desire. Desire leads us to, you know, as I explained before about how I felt in my heart about wanting to create an anthology that was about a certain topic. My heart went pitter patter. I, I wanted to do something. I wanted to get up in the morning and create and do. And so desire has a positive nature. Uh, every day when we get out of our beds, and now that's not even a small thing, now that we're all cooped up, like the idea of getting up every morning and engaging with the world and doing our professions and doing our lives, those are very healthy, good impulses right now. That, that gets us out of bed, that gets us moving. Uh, I want to be able to fit into my jeans again, so I'll take a walk every day. These are good impulses right now, so not so bad. So let's explore um, the covenant, the idea of coveting a little bit more. In handily, we have the Ten Commandments twice in the Torah, once in Exodus, once in Deuteronomy. And what's nice here is that the language is slightly different in the Deuteronomy version. So of course, we now have a nice little synonym, uh, some parallel language thrown in so we can flesh it out more. So here, rather than just saying lo mode, we all ha also have the parallel, and I put that in the blue, blue the lo uh, tifave, do not crave. Now, you know, if you've ever been in the position of wanting something, I'm not talking about coveting, but just wanting something so badly, and again, I know we all have that right now. You know, we're all in a state of deprivation in some ways, of grief. We, we want certain things. And so you, you may be just craving to see your children or your grandchildren. You may be craving to be able to travel or go back to work or your office or have that asparagus, whatever it is that you just wish you could have. So at what point does that kind of go off the scale and become a bad thing? When does it become coveting? Of course, this has to do with possession, um, but it isn't just the impulse of the desire. It has to be something a little bit more than that that gets us to, into trouble. Or again, most of us would be in trouble every single day. We would be wanting things um, and then working towards them. So again, when we want things, it's not necessarily bad. The question is, what is the limit? What is the moment that it, be, that it tips into the bad zone? Okay, so just continuing on here. Um, the rabbis struggle with the idea of coveting and trying to understand, is this a commandment that has to do with action or is it solely about thought? Now, I've just explored it a lot about thought and being, and I just told you, in fact, like the, the, the uh, impulse to want and to desire things and even to crave things is not necessarily a bad thing, that maybe there's a limit. But the rabbis over time did have some other thoughts about this, including that it may be an action. And one of the good reasons they thought it may be an action is that we see the word in other places in our sacred scriptures of the entire Hebrew Bible uh, being used as, um, as a synonym for other actions. So here in the book of Micah, just a classic example, lo tachmod, um, here in the, that they are doing it, um, they covet fields and seize them, houses and take them away. They defraud men of their homes and people of their land. So here the word um, uh, is being uh, used in parallel to these other very active verbs. So the problem with this, okay, so if you decide to buy into this idea that, um, that this is a action uh, kind of verb, um, and then therefore the commandment is an action verb, is that what about the other commandments? This is the 10th of the 10 commandments. And we have, especially in that second half, a lot of action-oriented commandments. And, uh, and there seems to be a conflict there because the Torah is known and certainly our interpretation of Torah, this is what the rabbis teach us, is that nothing should be redundant. It means something new if something seems redundant. So if it is um, an action of taking especially, well, doesn't that point to other commandments that teach us the same thing? And we can't have that. 
So we move on and see what uh, some other smart rabbis and thinkers thought about uh, the idea of coveting and tachmod. So here an early thinker, Philo of Alexandria, uh, early first century, um, says that the last five commandments dictate controlling emotions and desires and deeds and words and then intentions. So this points us to thought. So that uh, in the second half of the Ten Commandments, these are more interactions among uh, people, and that this idea of not coveting leads us to the idea that we need to control our emotions and desires. And therefore, it is a thought, and, and we don't want our thoughts then to lead to action, but it all starts with thought. Uh, here is Abraham Barahia Hanasi from the 12th century. Uh, coveting is a thought commandment between human and individual. Other thought commandments are uh, like no other gods. Is That's between God and the individual. Honoring your parents is between the family unit and the individual. So they're showing that this is in um, continuity with the other 10 commandments that there are uh, and you can look at the Ten Commandments and say, well, part of them are thought commandments and thought of the, part of them are action commandments. And, and, and among these three commandments, we cover three different types of relationships. Nachmanides, um, that is uh, Maimonides' grandson, uh, Ramban, 12th century, um, he taught that envy leads to all other sins. So it is a gateway commandment. It is trying to stop us from going on to doing other things. So if we break this commandment, it then leads to breaking other commandments, but it is the thought part that then leads to the action. And uh, Luzzato is um, from the 18th century. And the final end of envy will only occur with the coming of the Messiah, meaning a totally just society. That's interesting because, um, at least as a rabbi, I find that interesting, is that so many people will tell me, well, I'm not that religious rabbi, I just keep the Ten Commandments. And I you know, often feel like I would never say this, but I kind of feel like I could. Have you read them lately? <laughs> because if you've read them lately, you would know you're probably breaking them fairly often. Not all of them, you know, obviously, but, um, but if you read them, they're actually some of them we, we do kind of break because they're hard not to. And I think that's a nice recognition that the imperfection of humanity are striving to be better. So that's why I threw that one in there. Okay, just going on, we're going to actually stream ahead here. Um, so before I was talking about need versus want, and again, in normative life, it is perhaps easier for the regular person. Obviously a person who is in some other form of trauma, whether it be homelessness or poverty uh, or something else, uh, they, they experience every day what many of us are experiencing now, a sense of trauma, and it really adjusts and uh, our, our needs and wants. It's not what we regularly experience in our lives. So how do we bring uh, to any moment in our life, how do we discern the difference between needs and, and wants? So you may be familiar with this well-known quote, quote from Ecclesiastes Kohelet, um, a lover of money never has his fill of money, nor a lover of wealth his fill of income. That too is futile. Ohev Kesef, so this lover of money, um, it is endless. This is a bad thing to be. Again, Judaism does not say money is bad. It doesn't mean pursuing money is bad. But to be ohev kesef is, is something more extreme. It, it seems to have this covetous uh, dimension to it that is just never going to be sated. And, you know, right now we feel like many things in our lives are not being sated because, frankly, they aren't but it is different than, than having this endless pit that can't be filled. We know that eventually we will get some filling. We're just gonna get you know, beyond this and, and we will fill up again. Okay, one of my favorite quotes, and I'm sure you know it very well from Pierre K. Boat, uh, Ethics of the Fathers, 
And I have Benzoma there in the slide just to remind you because it's not part of this text, but in the section above, we are told these are all sayings from Benzoma. And uh, of course, Ezahu Ashir. And who is the rich one? Uh, Hasameach Behelko, the one who is happy with his lot. As it is said, now this is the part that usually we don't see when we quote this. Usually we stop after he was happy with his lot and we all feel good and go home. But we actually have to see what is the proof text? What, what is this uh, biblical text that's being brought forward as, uh, and being linked to the saying? That's what a proof text is. So here from Psalms, when you eat from the work of your hands, you will be happy and it will be well with you. So here it is not just the contentment with what you have, but a sense of satisfaction. And in Judaism, we feel there's great satisfaction in working and in earning your keep. And it's not only the intrinsic of doing, and when I say working, that can be what you do in retirement. It doesn't mean being of, of uh, the age of just going to work, but it means creating, doing, hands-on. And so, you know, one of the shortages we see right now is yeast and flour. Now, partially, it is hard to maybe get bread at the grocery stores right now, but, you know, thank God, I know I can, you know, call Bovella's and I can order my challah and we can put on our mask and gloves and drive down there and we pick up our challah. So I don't need to bake challah, but I've seen on Facebook all my very talented rabbi colleagues, not me, I don't know how to bake a challah, but so many of my colleagues are baking challah every single week. Part of it is that we are in the state of deprivation. And yes, like when you do things, whether it means like Aileen has and Morgenthal, you've, you've called me, you my family, I'm your, on your, your you know, phone a friend list and you, you know, others at the temple have been calling people just to see how are you, hello. And when you're engaged in life, you, you feel the product of your hands and there is satisfaction in that and therefore you are more content. This is a beautiful teaching about our relationship to uh, who we are and how we, we relate to the world and to the material as well. So yeah, there's great happiness when you bake a challah, you know, perhaps. I, don't, I haven't had that experience myself, but I know when I make dinner during this period or when I do bake something, because I, I like baking, um, yeah, like, wow, it tastes a lot better these days. Okay. Let's just continue on. Um, so here, um, I wanted to look at a narrative of coveting. So here, this is a well-known story, um, narrative from the Torah. Um, maybe you've seen the movie, just, just joking. Um, so this is the line of Jacob. At 17 years of age, Joseph tended the flocks of his brothers as a helper to the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. And Joseph brought bad reports of them to their father. Now Israel, meaning Jacob, loved Joseph best of all of his sons, for he was the child of his old age, and he had made him an or ornamented tunic. In the Hebrew, it says, katonet pasim. So we're going to come back to that in a second. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of his brothers, they hated him so that he could not speak a friendly word to him. So we usually know that very uh, well-known tunic as the multicolored tunic, right? But that's not what the Hebrew tells us. The Hebrew tells it, us that it's a katonet pasim. We're going to explore what that might be in a second. But for whatever reason, uh, because of the flow of the, the parallelist language, it seems to create ire among his brothers. So, and they, they seem to have, it doesn't say in the Hebrew, it doesn't say in the English that they have a covetous reaction, but I would definitely, and I'm sure you would too, uh, categorize this as a covetous reaction because we know the way that they, they uh, proceed. So here Rashi teaches us that pasim is a term for just a remnant of fine wool, that it's a very nice quality wool. 
Um, so in that sense, uh, his, his father is treating him differently. We know that he's not working in the fields because we know there's a difference here. And we know he's dressed differently. So that seems to smack of favoritism. Those of us who have uh, siblings, of course, throughout our youth would, would accuse our, our uh, parents of uh, favoring the other one all the time. Um, but here, perhaps they have good reason to, to make this accusation at this moment. And so uh, Tsvorna in the 15th century um, says that this Katona Pasim is uh, a visible sign that Joseph was intended uh, by the father to become the leader of all the brothers, both at home and in the field. And the use, and that it was a tradition that the use of such distinctive cloth uh, symbolized one's elevated stature, um, and that this is also found in the book of Isaiah. So uh, with another case, not with the, the case of Joseph. Um, so that we, uh, you know, we understand that, uh, you know, it's a certain uniform, it's a of elevated status, like just like you would see in our own society, in uh, the military or in uh, law enforcement, that, you know, people have different uh, uniforms dep depending on their status, and it shows that they oversee other people, um, even like a manager in a store. So uh, the brothers have something here to be covetous about. Um, I bring the story forward because we know that then they, they plan his murder, they, then it's aborted, and they sell him into slavery. But the idea of coveting being thought versus action, we can see here that the actions have their root in thought, that, they, that their covetous, their jealousy, their envy starts to grow in, uh, in the way their father has set things up or something more intrinsic to who they are and then it leads to horrific actions. Okay, continuing on, this is one of my favorite texts. I think I've already said that once already. This is what happens when I teach. Um, I have a lot of favorite texts. Um, they're all beautiful. You're like, they're all, they're all special children. Um, so here, uh, I, I love this one because you have the same question that was in the Pirkei Avot that we saw a few slides back. When, who is, who is wealthy? Is a who sheer? And rather than giving that answer, the one who is of the same, so the, the Samer de Halko, the one who's happy with his lot, we have a very different answer. And again, I want you to be thinking, frankly, about what we're all experiencing right now. You know, maybe what we thought made us happy two months ago isn't what makes us happy right now. Maybe, um, you know, I, 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 have been I talk to a lot of rabbis because that's part of my work is supporting rabbis as they are supporting others in trauma. So, uh, you know, this can be a very clarifying moment for people when you're, when you're in crisis and in trauma, in, in grief, um, and your idea of what is, um, you know, makes you feel stated and happy, or even what you define as feeling a sheer wealthy can really shift. You know, maybe right now, like when you get, the, you know, toilet paper, you feel like you've just won the lottery. Um, okay, so they saw who, the sages ask who is wealthy, anyone who gets pleasure from his wealth. So that's a little bit different to be happy with what you have. It is to gain pleasure from it. Um, so right now you could have a really nice car sitting in your driveway and all the, all you're doing is, you know, driving into, uh, the town center and getting a few groceries coming home and getting hundred miles per gallon. And, um, and that car doesn't seem so important right now. Maybe, maybe be, being able to get your medication just seems like, or, or the toilet paper or the bird seed seems like actually what is giving you pleasure from your money. So then they go on to this, um, mnemonic of different rabbis. So I'm just going to skip to here. Rabbi Tarpon, these are all very familiar, familiar names to us. Uh, a wealthy person is one who has a hundred vineyards and a hundred fields and a hundred slaves working in them. Again, you can, might see that as indentured uh, servants. Um, so uh, Rabbi Tarpon was a very wealthy rabbi, no surprise there. When he's asked, like, okay, what does it mean to be wealthy? He gives us an answer that is very traditional, maybe what you expect. Uh, because he is wealthy and that's how he defines it. Rabbi Akiva says, one who has a wife whose actions are pleasant. So, you know, God willing, a lot of people are saying that about their loved ones right now, with whom, whomever they are sequestered right now, they're thinking, wow, I am blessed to be with someone who, who is so pleasant to be with during this crisis, 
or how pleasant it is to have people who call me and are so good to me during this crisis? What does it mean to have people who care about you, who, who surround you either literally or, or remotely? We, we now all understand that. What does it mean to have a community that cares about us? Who, oops, sorry about that. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, so here, Rabbi Akiva, if you remember, I'm not gonna tell the whole story now. Maybe we'll do it some other time. It's one of my favorites again. I know I'm saying it, sorry. They're all good, all good texts. Um, Rabbi Akiva has an amazing love story about his wife who inspires him to go from being an illiterate shepherd to being the great Rabbi Akiva. So his wife is the reason why he is everything he became. Okay, but Rabbi Yose says something very different and unexpected and a little bit of a laugh, especially for a she or about toilet paper, a lesson about toilet paper. Anyone who has a bathroom close to his table. Rabbi Yose was known to have stomach problems, I guess, uh, you know, Jewish people, what can I say? Um, and so, um, that is what he's saying was a luxury for him. This is what he needed. So yeah, like right now, uh, this being in self-isolation, being in the middle of a pandemic has clarified the things that we actually need. Um, you know, what is it that I actually need? And this is what he actually needs. Very clarifying. Okay, moving forward. Uh, what does it mean to grapple with coveting in a crisis? So, you know, when we talk about this time, we talk about um, how unique it is. We, of course, talk about uh, times in history when we as a society have struggled with similar things, whether it's the 1918 Spanish flu um, or other things. But, you know, being part of the Jewish people gives us this amazing longevity of history. And this trajectory of the Jewish people, of course, struggling with so many things over so many millennia. And I have to tell you, when things get hard or dark, I really draw strength from that. I really think, wow, look what our people have been through. Like, we, we've got this. We can pull through this, too. So the interesting thing is when you start to talk about the language around coveting, if you remember in the Deuteronomy verse, we saw the parallel language for tachmod, coveting, with craving, titaveh. And the interesting thing is that if you go to another moment in history when the Israelites were struggling and in crisis, when they are enslaved and then freed and now wandering through the desert and they don't know how long it's going to take them, they don't know when they're going to be freed from the stasis not knowing when they're going to get out of this limbo and actually come to Israel and, and be able to get on with their lives, they crave. They, it's the same exact verb. So here uh, that tita ve comes up again, and the riffraff, meaning that this, uh, well, we won't go into that, that's a whole other lesson who these are, but these are the, perhaps the Israelites, um, felt a gluttonous craving. And then the Israelites wept and they said, they are in a state of deprivation, or at least they think they are. They are definitely stressed. They don't know what's happening to them. It's scary for them. And so they have this craving and they cry out, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Now our gullets, meaning our throats are shriveled, and there's nothing at all nothing but this mana to look at. Now, notice I was in verse three through six of Numbers 11. And if you jump all the way to the end of that passage in Numbers 34, that place comes to be known as Kirbot Hatava, which means the graves of craving, because the people who were craving, these people who called out and, and were complaining to God about their situation end up being struck dead and are, end up being buried there. And in fact, God sends meat and they choke on it. It's a really gruesome passage. But I bring it forward because it shows how under strain people perhaps don't, you know, first their memories shift, like, you know, I, you know, we all complain about things in our normal lives, you know, and now like we're, 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 we wish we could do those things. 
they seem marvelous. I remember every single year complaining about matzah. I've never really liked matzah. I have to tell you this year, the matzah never tasted better. Like we've got one box left and I know at some point if, if we're still in self-isolation, I'm gonna be eating that box and I'm gonna love every single crumb. You know, who knew, who knew I could love matzah? So it, it definitely changes your, your, your outlook. Um, so here, these people are complaining, but the weird thing is, um, as we've learned in other passages, that they actually have been receiving quail. They've been receiving meat. Um, when you look at that list of things, like, you know, that was what was so great about Egypt, really? Like these foods? That seems really unlikely. You were enslaved. Don't you remember that part? Um, so it just changes their perspective of what, what that needs versus wants. And that's understandable. It's a lot of stress. So here in a parallel uh, twice told tale kind of way, we're going to jump to Exodus um, to see another narrative having to do with um, mana. So here um, they cry out, if only we had died by the hand of Adonai in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, when we ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to starve this whole congregation to death. And Adonai said to Moses, I will rain down bread for you from the sky and the people shall go out and gather each day's portion. And thus I may test them to see whether they will follow my commandments or not. Now, I don't think our current um, pandemic is uh, wrought by God. I don't think that, that this is some sort of great theological test for us. Not at all. I, I, I really don't. Um, but I bring this because here we see people who are under stress in some ways, like we are under stress, albeit different. And, and here God is part of the test. Uh, here it's attributed to God, and I would not say that, but um, is how do you deal with that stress? So unfortunately, the Israelites, as we know many times when they're tested, not so good. They don't do so well. But what's interesting about the way that they don't do well, guess what? They hoard. They are actually hoarding mana. So, um, so here we have that narrative. Um, on the sixth day, they apportioned what they brought in. It shall be uh, proved to be a double the amount they gathered up each night. So here is the commandment that they are supposed to, on the sixth day, do a double portion so that on Shabbat they'll have and not have to go out and gather. That, by the way, is the root of the custom of having two loaves of challah bread on a Friday night. Um, and, um, and here is about eating flesh. So that shows that, that they'll have the meat and then they'll have the mana. So when they're complaining in that narrative in, in numbers, it doesn't align with the reality of what we're told in Exodus. Okay, so now we're told how they're supposed to collect it. And this is where they don't do what they're supposed to do. The Israelites did so, some gathering much, some little. But when they measured it by the Omer, Ah, a measurement. If you are aware, we're in the period between the second day of Passover all the way to Shavuot. We're counting the Omer every night, the sheaves of barley, uh, symbolically by that counting and counting the days in between. Maybe that too has so much more uh, meaning this year as we count our days in self-isolation and wondering what comes next. Mm -hmm. um, but here, what's interesting is if you gather too much or too little, you would end up with the same, just what they needed to eat. Wow. Moses says to them, don't leave any of it over until the morning. Do they listen to Moses? No, of course not. They paid no attention to Moses. Some left it out until morning and it became infested with maggots and stank and Moses was angry with them. And so they gathered it every morning, each as much as he needed to eat. And when the sun grew hot, it would melt. So yeah, we could tell everyone like, you know, there'll be enough toilet paper for everyone. Just take what you need. And yet people hoard, people hoard. And this is a human instinct. And here we see it millennia ago. Okay, moving forward, a little more exploration of these needs versus wants. Okay, so you can look at these poor Israelites and the state they're in, 
and and say well you know when they're they're complaining and they want all these foods from egypt yeah it must be so boring getting the same thing every single day and again we we especially now may have extra rahmanas for these israelites we may have more compassion for them because we understand now what it, it means to be in this kind of stasis and this this strange state of not knowing when we're going to get to the promised land the promised time of of release and and no fear about health and so um but that's not the reality at least the way the rabbis tell us so here from the talmud they're discussing the mana and they point out that in different texts, uh, both in Exodus, Numbers, a different place in, in the Exodus, the manna is described as bread, then oil, then honey. And the Talmud asked the question, Rabbi Yosei, son of Rabbi Hanina, for the youth it was like bread, for the elderly it was like oil, and for the children it was like honey. Each received what was appropriate. So as we try to reconcile these verses and why there are all these different synonyms for mana and different uh, descriptor nouns, um, it's saying that it tasted differently and provided for the needs of what people uh, had, what different needs you biologically had, in fact. That's pretty amazing. Um, so uh, the other text that we see, and I don't think I actually brought it, um, is that there are other midrashic texts that tell us that it tasted like anything you wanted except for one ultimate thing. It wouldn't taste like those five foods that the Israelites were craving in the book of Numbers. So it wouldn't taste like the melons, it wouldn't taste like, like garlic or the cucumbers. Um, but otherwise, it was this miraculous thing that would taste like anything you wanted. So an interesting smash up of need versus want. Okay, just moving forward. Um, strategic planning for crisis versus hoarding. Um, so we saw examples now of hoarding, of uh, wanting beyond our, our real needs, um, having a really warped perception of what needs are. And uh, going back to the uh, Joseph narrative, uh, just to think of, again about what it means to strategic plan and um, and to stockpile appropriately, but not to be in the realm of hoarding. This is very similar note to the conversation of like when do you go into the coveting zone? Like what is the difference between having an appropriate stockpile of toilet paper versus hoarding? Like when when can we say you're a hoarder? Um, so here. Uh, we know this text. Accordingly, let Pharaoh find a man of discernment and wisdom and set him over the land of Egypt. And let Pharaoh take steps to appoint overseers over the land and organize the land of Egypt with the seven years of plenty. Let all the food of these good years that are coming to be gathered and let the grain be collected under Pharaoh's authority as food be stored in the cities. And of course, we know that Joseph ends up being that uh, steward of all these resources at a, at a very important time that ends up being a huge crisis. So, um, so here we have an example of good stewardship, not hoarding. Here is another example from the book of Esther. Here, Esther, where we know this line, and again, I have to say, um, you know, it, reading this text in real time during this pandemic and during, uh, you know, our, my individual, my household's, you know, search for certain things that we either need or want, um, you know, has brought a new reading to many of these texts for me and I hope tonight for you too. Um, here, this is a text that I used to read so differently. When the turn came for Esther, daughter of Abihal, the uncle of Mordecai, who had adopted her as his own daughter, to go to the king, he did not, she did not ask for anything but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, guardian of the women, advised. Yet Esther won the admiration of all who saw her. So I have to say, growing up and even into adulthood and into uh, being a rabbi and teaching this text, 
I used to see this as a text about how Esther wasn't won over by the glamour of um, King Ahasuerus's castle and by all these things that were available to her. And it was, it was, uh, and often this is framed as another dimension of Esther's modesty, her sneut, that she is not one to be um, won over by, you know, fancy clothes and beautiful oils and all these things that a king would have at her disposal to make herself beautiful. Um, but now when I read this, she, of course, she, the atmosphere she's in is not one of deprivation, but she is in survival mode. She is in crisis. She is, um, you know, maybe worried about what's, she is worried about what's going to happen to her next. And, and therefore, um, she needs to be smart about what she, how she navigates her situation. And so just like Joseph, and I think it's interesting because there are many texts and scholars that actually draw parallels between Joseph living in Pharaoh's world and Esther living in King Ahasuerus's world. There are many uh, interesting uh, uh, associations between the two of them. And in fact, I, I have taught, I've taught these, uh, the parallels in these texts many times, uh, but I've never seen this one, that she here is a good steward of the resources that are given to her. And she's only taking what she, uh, you know, is advised to her. It's, it's uh, and, and for whatever reason, it's smart and people take note of it. So just putting it out there. Okay, continuing on. Um, and Phyllis, do we have to 8.30 or another time? I can't remember. It's, I can't hear you. You have to unmute mute. Yep. I don't think. Go ahead. So I'm going to just take a few more minutes. Is that okay, everybody? Sure. Okay. Thank I, you. I, yeah, I don't think there's a, a time limit. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, good, good. So, um, okay, so just continuing on here. Um, we're not going to go into the depth of this text, but I wanted to show that this impulse for the coveting uh, to go beyond just providing for needs, beyond just smart stewardship, uh, goes um, beyond food. Uh, in the uh, Exodus narrative, we also, of course, see the very horrific moment of building the golden calf. And this is a moment when the Israelites long for a tactile God, like everybody has. And this is, we don't see that language right here, but we see it in other parts of, of the Torah, this idea of longing for what other peoples have, a God that you can see and touch, not this, you know, God that, that, Moses uh, goes up to some mountain and experiences. So uh, another moment of coveting that thought leading to bad action. Okay, continuing on here. And this is um, my pent ultimate text. Uh, so here, um, individual need juxtaposed against communal need. And in some ways, I think during this pandemic, this is the answer to the entire conundrum of coveting versus contentment and what it means during a time of crisis. And when we are coveting things, when we're going into covetous behavior, when our behavior leads us to places that are bad, including hoarding, opposed to um, uh, taking care of our own needs in a smart way, the way Queen Esther did, for instance, or the way Joseph did. So here Rabbi Yochanan says, and this is a very cryptic little text, so, but we'll unpack it. Rain falls even for the sake of an individual in response to the petition of a single person in need of rain, whereas the blessing of sustenance comes only for the sake of many. Rabbi Yochanan further proves that sustenance comes for the sake of many, as it is written, quote, behold, I will cause rain. Uh, I don't know why it says that it has bread there. Let me see. Let me just take a look at the Hebrew and see what went wrong there. Uh, rain. Uh, ah, it's, uh, I reversed it. Because I will cause bread to rain from the heavens for you. Um, 
So here they're actually taking that mana text again. Uh, just funny how many times that pops up there. That's not actually how I got to it. Um, but here uh, he's talking about two different types of prayers. One when you are doing supplication for rain and one for sustenance. And, um, and making the argument, and there are different commentators that do, say different things. If uh, one prays, Rashi especially says, if one prays for rain, uh, you are talking about rain coming down and, and, and bringing water to your parched field so that field does not die or it doesn't have very poor yield. But when we make a prayer for sustenance, we're talking about feeding many. Now you could argue this text many different ways and it probably needs a little bit deeper digging. But it came, when I, when I thought of this text, I thought about that, that dichotomy between that individual need and communal need. And as we think of our own needs, we as individuals really need to be led by our ethics to also think about other people's needs. So if we were allowed to go to the store, like many people were at the beginning of this pandemic, and just buy up all the toilet paper, or you know, we see these horrific cases on the, the news where people have um, you know, brought up every mask and, and box of gloves, they have in a warehouse and they're charging um, just exorbitant amounts of money for one mask and a box of gloves and trying to sell them to hospitals even and, and keeping them from the people who need it, our essential workers and medical workers, to be able to take care of our society. Um, that, that's different than making sure that you have a couple of extra rolls of toilet paper or that you have enough medication to take care of yourself uh, at times when it's hard to get out and when it's hard to connect with the pharmacy. It's a very different thing. And of course, that leads to the very well-known teaching from Pierre Kiavot, uh, when Hillel used to say, if I'm not for myself, who is for me? If I am only for myself, what am I? If not now, when? Judaism allows us to take care of ourselves. We don't need to be ascetics. We don't even need to be martyrs. We don't need to sacrifice um, the things that we need to sustain ourselves during this time but we are also not allowed to be so self-centered that it means that we are taking from what other people need. So at this time when, when we are so physically centered on ourselves because we are each in our own space, the more we can reach out to others and help them and say, I'm going to the grocery store, what do you need? Uh, the more we can reach out and give money to our food pantries and help those who don't have access or to uh, share our stockpile, uh, the better. Uh, we do need to take care of ourselves, but we also need to think about the communal needs because ultimately that's what's going to preserve us all. Um, I'm going to unshare my screen. And if there are any, uh, I, I'm assuming no questions came up along the way. I don't know if you were all just so mesmerized or um, anything. Let me, there's one chat, if you don't, let me just see it. Doesn't it rain on everyone? Brett, I was thinking about that. And, you know, I've had some really um, ex ex extraordinary experiences, even here on East Broad Street with microclimates. Um, you know, I, I've, I've had, mo I remember years ago, um, Arie and Taria um, went over to Union County uh, College to play tennis. Um, he was like in middle school. And um, it started pouring here horrifically. And, um, and, I, and I jumped into the car because they had walked over there to get them. And when I got there, it was bright and sunny. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed by how different, you know, it was. I, I said, didn't you notice a storm come through? And I said, no, it's been bright and sunny here the whole time. And whatever storm it was had just, you know, gone in a different direction and never touched, you know, basically a few blocks from here. So um, I, 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 again, that's a cryptic text, but I do wonder if perhaps that's what the rabbis were reflecting, that you can have rain in one place and not the other place, but sustenance is about bringing food to everybody. Mm -hmm. 
Well, um, I am sorry we're not as interactive as usual, but I have to tell you, it, it really warms my heart to see all your faces. And um, I'm very grateful to be able to share some of the material that I've been sharing with other communities. It makes me very happy to be able to share it with my home, with Temple Emmanuel and all of you. And I hope we'll find some other opportunities uh, during uh, the year um, or, or more to uh, share some of this material in other forms at the temple. Um, it's just uh, lots of great stuff. Most of all, I do hope that you will have your needs uh, provided for. I hope you will be kind and patient with yourselves um, as we all weather this storm and to let everyone at the temple um, know what you need so we can support you as well. Phyllis, any other messages that we should be sharing? Any other programs in Chat Shabbat 9 a.m., of course, Shabbat services, anything else? Rabbi, how can we get a copy of your new book? <laughs> Thank you. It's on Amazon. You can go there or you can go to ccrpress.org. Um, but uh, the Sacred Exchange. Thank you. It's also on Kindle. So whatever. And there's a really nice study guide that's going with it. And, um, and we're going to be uh, pulling out some, the publisher is going to be pulling out some of the materials to do a, a special um, a uh, pandemic study guide to go with it, actually. That is forthcoming. Can you, wait a minute, can you, can you hear me? We can. Okay, I don't know why it looks like muting. I uh, just want to say people have said thank you, you've done a great job, and that was, I just wanted to make sure you saw that. Thank you, Rab. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It warms my heart to see everybody here. And thank you, Mary, and we will be seeing, you know, hearing more about this a message we all have to learn. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Take good care, everyone. Lila Tove, um, and uh, be well. You too. Stay well, everybody. Stay well. Mm -hmm.